which is what you're talking about. And there's other things that are injected into chickens that are also very concerning, like antibiotics um, and, and other, and other um, animal crops. So they can only, they're only allowed to use hormones that are specific to the animal, but it does alter their growth. And because even though we think we're not that similar to a chicken, we biologically we're still um, related <laughs> one way or another, even though it's a distant relationship. And so some research suggests that um, those kinds of changes in our food, not just hormones, but antibiotics and, and other drugs used to maximize production to make chickens with really big breasts because breast meat is trendy in the United States. And what happens with the parts that we don't eat, like the neck and the tail, those actually get shipped to places like Ghana and Samoa and Papua New Guinea uh, and those folks are eating substandard, grisly, fatty products that are not um, high in nutrition, but that become a delicacy because it's imported and it's, um, it becomes worked into their traditional dishes. So it's not only that the way we produce meat is harming us, it's also, it's also connected to these other economies where people are being fed substand substandard foods too. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of attention around that, and there's a lot of research into it. And Monsanto works really hard uh, to silence that research. The biggest case has been with milk <coughs> and the use of bovine growth hormone in the milk, which helps produce more milk. Um, but also, uh, scientists at, at I don't remember which university it was um, said, well, this there's some concerning things about this, and we don't think we should use it commercially, um, but Monsanto had them all fired, uh, and that's a problem with our university system right now, is that even though I'm, I'm technically, I'm an employee of the state, uh, as are my colleagues at, at the University of California, uh, but in the sciences, they're getting a lot of money from these private um, companies, especially agribusiness companies and bi biochemistry companies, and they start funding that research, um, and then that controls how the results are, are disseminated. So there's no autonomy or intellectual freedom in a lot of the science schools, including Fresno State, which is the ag department is funded by Harris, Farm, Harris Ranch and Foster Farms. And so our students are learning how to reproduce that system without thinking about the consequences of it, including health consequences, including environmental consequences. Um, in the Washington DC area, there's a lot of chicken production and all of the waste from that goes into the river system and is causing a lot of harm uh, to, to communities there, including um, the African American communities that helped make that chicken industry what it is through their work, or through their labor and they continue to. So there's a lot out there. I don't know all of the specifics of it, um, but it's something, it's something that you know, my students could create a worksheet or a fact sheet, or a video, or something. Uh, maybe with some help from the young and back there. <laughs> <laughs> and through, through your work career of, of teaching, have you noticed any research that these packing houses or rendering plants are more the Communities of color or poverty versus, say, a river park or closures. Mm -hmm. Are they more around the poverty type? Yes. Yeah, that's nationally, well, not nationally recognized, but several studies, including, uh, I'm blanking on his name, but he's a very famous researcher, uh, Bullard, um, who has done studies on environmental racism. And it's in Louisiana. There's a whole, uh, whole communities known as Cancer Alley because of all the petroleum plants that locate in the rural parts of, of Louisiana where African Americans have settled, um, sometimes by force and sometimes by choice to get away from um, hostility and violence in, in more urban areas um, from, from white settlers. And um, there's very, very high cancer rates. And one of my colleagues, um, did research there and went to the cemetery and found that most of the people there were dead before they were, you know, 60 or 50. And 
you know, because it's a predominantly African American community, that affects like the, the longevity um, rates between different groups. Um, and often it's attributed to, oh, well, you, they don't eat right, or they don't exercise, or this, that, and the other thing. But there's so many other things going on in our lives that are beyond our individual control that are often erased from research. But there's also research that, that shows in a lot of different communities. Another one that comes to mind, and my colleague in public health at the University of North Carolina has been working with um, grassroots groups to challenge the pig industry. Uh, and all of the pig poo wafts into these communities and it's contaminating the water and they don't dispose of the dead pigs the right way so it's causing a lot of bacterial outbreaks and they've been fighting that for a really long time trying to do lawsuits and that's <coughs> a, it's unfortunately it's it's one of it's the only way not the only way but it's one of the only ways to go at directly at the, the big players. It's not the only way, but it's often what we choose to do, like with the, the Darling plant, suing them. But it's a long, it's a long haul. And I don't know if we have that long to wait for lawsuits to come to fruition. And that's something I've observed in my work um, with pesticide exposure on the Central Coast in Watsonville and Salinas. We have this data that says that the rate of exposure for brown children is really high, and there's been a lot of research on what the effects are developmentally for um, babies in utero and for children growing up. Their IQ levels are lower, they're developmentally delayed, they have trouble reading, and researchers have made these connections um, and sometimes and then use that data to try and sue the people who are in charge of making sure we're safe, like the Ag Commissioner or um, the Department of Pesticide Regulation in, in the state of California, but then they sit on it for years and years and years and nothing changes. Um, and then they'll come up, they'll finally say yes, the EPA in, in this case said yes, um, these children have had higher rates of exposure, let's put a monitoring device in the community and see, see how it's changed. And so that'll be another 10 years of data with no action. So the challenge for, for me and for communities is, well, how do we make it, how do we mobilize it faster? But it's hard, it's hard because it can take a long time for those bad effects to, to, to present. And there's so many other confounding factors that could, could shape our health. It makes it hard to pinpoint things, even though like at, a, at an organic level, we can feel it in our bones, so to speak. No, something's up with that plant and it's affecting our health, but it can be really challenging to, to say it with like scientific precision. But that doesn't mean it's not true. But that's what the, the regulators want to see is like concrete evidence. And sometimes it just seems like the body counts aren't enough. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to be really depressing. But that's the challenge. But the, the really exciting thing is that a lot of, I am really glad that I know a lot of researchers who are, you know, um, wired like me who use, try to use their work to, to challenge those things. And I think there are more of us at Fresno State with these new hires, but um, I can't speak for, for everybody. And I don't want to, or I'll get fired, so. Um, <laughs> But um, you know that's that's the, that makes it challenging. Change takes a long time, but do we have time? Does the planet have time? Do our individual bodies have that?